Good evening, folks. Um, my name is Sofia Lemus. I'm the Associate Curator of Public Programs. It's really a, it's a, such a, a, a pleasure to, to see you all gathering here uh, live, online, on site at Andres Sala today. Um, so I'm truly humbled and truly thrilled uh, that this is an option, that we were able to open this biennial, uh, and that we are able to join uh, Jack Alberstam, uh, who's speaking to, to us with, uh, with us today from New York City. Um, and I hope you don't mind, I've made a few, wrote, a few notes on my phone that I'd love to read to you. Uh, so I'll read just a short introduction to make sure that I acknowledge everyone um, and the wonderfully resilient and imaginative team who has made this all happen. So I'd love to take the opportunity to acknowledge uh, the people who have been relentlessly, relentlessly working with us online and on-site, beginning with the founder and commissioner of this biennial, uh, Agnia, and the wonderful team uh, that materialized its ethos, Anastasia, Olga, Igors, um, and Inez, to the sensitive and inventive powerhouse that is uh, Rebecca Lamarche Vadel, the chief curator of Riboka II, uh, with whom I have the immense, immense pleasure to collaborate with and to have imagined uh, this online series of talks and conversations with. Um, I'd like to um, thank, um, in particular, the truly wonderful being that is Laima Hadouza, our coordinator. Um, uh, of the entire series and the teams that she's been working with from legal to video editors to translators to transcribers and so on, uh, as well as Yeva, Laura and Aya for their continued support. Um, I'd like to say a special thank you to the marvelous educational team of Riboka 2 who have put, a wonderful, have put together a wonderful program of educational activities um, for the young based on the glossary for desirable worlds uh, that the series is based on. And um, also to uh, Manuel Burger, whose dynamic design has really made the series stand out. Um, finally, I'd like to thank our media partners, Atir Cultura, uh, Our Territory, and MUS, for the thoughtful and engaging um, expansions of our series in both musical and written formats, and whose outreach cannot could be contained. So an important reflection that we have repeatedly returned to in the series um, and in different in instances throughout has been the science fiction writer Ursula Le Guin and whose wild worlding uh, I'd like to cite here today as a prompt to reflect the space that we're uh, currently inhabiting and, and currently sharing. Um, and I would like to address specifically the 1974 novel um, The Dispossessed. Um, where one of the characters describes the world as, and I quote, we have nothing to give you but your own freedom. We have no law but the single principle of mutual aid between individuals. We have no government but the single pr principle of free association. We have no states, no nations, no presidents, no premiers, no chiefs, no generals, no bosses, no bankers, no landlords. We have no wages, no charity, no police, we have no soldiers, no wars, nor do we have much else. We have sharers, not owners. We are not prosperous. None of us is rich. None of us is powerful. If it is the future that you seek, then I tell you, you must come to it with empty hands. You must come to it alone and naked as the child comes into the world, into his future, without any past, without any property, wholly dependent on other people for his life. You cannot take what you have not been given, and you must give yourself." Unquote. These words are a really powerful description um, of a post-capitalist society where the lack of natural resources um, and the neighboring powers heightens the need for solidarity and for mutual aid. And I'd like to bring this, uh, I'd like to bring this quote forward today um, as a kind of resonance between uh, Rebecca's um, introduction to this exhibition and to, and to this biennial's edition, where she mentions that the Andres Sala, the derelict industrial port that we're currently sharing space with, stands as a metaphor for the ruptures of modern utopias, of Soviet ideals, of capitalist hopes, and she asks how to work with this inherited space. 
So she notes that the, this biennials is really a, a, an investigation of art's capacity to, to be a catalyst for metamorphosis, to coexist with collapsed spaces and with unruly zoonotic pandemics that really have uh, disrupt the plans that uh, they, the team had began with. Uh, so this biennial is really um, the showing and the desire to welcome uncertainty. Over the years that I have known Jack Calberstam, uh, I could not have imagined a more fitting and more outstanding voice uh, to inspire our thoughts and the social formations that may emerge from this particular episode for this welcoming of uncertainty from uh, the ungovernable, ungovernable from the otherwise. So in 2014, uh, Jack, in collaboration with the performance studies scholar Tavia Nyong'o, um, wrote, and I quote, we live in wild times, we bear witness to wild and ruinous places, unquote. And I ask you, can you hear the echoes? Can you hear the echoes sounding today? So fittingly, our glossary word for this week is wildness, to which Jack responds with unmaking, unbuilding, and the sensibility for inheriting or inhabiting spaces rendered uninhabitable by modernity. But some of the artworks of this exhibition show clearly that they are crammed with life forms of their own. So Jack is a professor of uh, gender studies and English at Columbia University. Um, and his reflections on forms of difference, haptic relations to knowing, and aesthetic practices I encountered years ago uh, on a seminar about Wes Anderson's fantastic Mr. Fox, I don't know if you remember this film, and on Lady Gaga. So um, his unique ability to shuttle back and forth between high and low theory, high and low culture, foregrounds an unexpected and subversive understanding of popular culture, of avant-garde performance, queer art, um, his influential books, many of which maybe you know, uh, include Female Masculinity, In a Queer Time and Place, The Queer Art of Failure, Gaga Feminism, Sex, Gender, at the, and the End of Normal. He has recently published a short book titled Trans Asterix, a quick and quirky account of gender variance, and will release a new title at the end of this year, Wild Things, The Disorder of Desire, a second volume on wildness titled The Wild Beyond, Art, Architecture and Anarchy is Due to Follow. So without further ado, uh, my heartfelt gratitude for everyone who's present here with us today on site and online, and to Jack for joining us from New York. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Jack. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sophia and uh, Lima and Anastasia and everybody on site. I wish I could have been there, um, but it sounds like everything is going brilliantly so far. So congratulations to all involved. Um, and thank you to Sophia for that uh, very thoughtful and provocative in introduction, which absolutely feeds into the kind of work that I want to present today, but also into the thinking I've been doing about anarchy. Uh, and unbuilding and unmaking. And I'll even try at the end of the talk to just say a few things about the Ursula Le Guin text that Sophia references because it is, The Dispossessed is such an amazing book for thinking about the project that I want to introduce you, to you today, which is a project in which we recognize that in a kind of way that runs against uh, past utopian projects that were all about building and creating and wielding and imagining, we're actually at a different moment right now. We're at a moment where we actually have to figure out how to unmake the world in which so much is wrong and so many are left out and so few profit. Okay, so towards that end, I want to think with you about wildness on the one hand and move towards an aesthetic of bewilderment on the other. Now, bewilderment is a really interesting word. In, in English, it means sort of, uh, in a way, becoming uh, wild, but more than that, it references becoming lost in space and time. And that's a really nice uh, concept to sort of not guide us, if you like. Uh, it doesn't, it's not the same as a, a term like rewilding, which is about putting animals back into some sort of space that we still 
understand as wild. Uh, I think those kinds of conservation projects are deeply suspicious. Bewilderment instead is a kind of permanent orientation to unknowing, unthinking, and unbecoming. So let's see what we can do with bewilderment as a kind of keyword uh, today. The other word, of course, that I'm using comes from this book that is uh, due to uh, be out uh, next month, Wild Things, The Disorder of Desire, in which I try to use the category of wild as a understanding it as something that has been produced by this ruinous discourse of civilization as the other to civilization, but also as a space that we can return back to now that uh, we're in a kind of post-civilizational state and think about what the potential and the possibility might be embedded within the category uh, of the wild. So I like to situate wildness in what we could call a post-colonial or even a decolonizing vein. It's a critical tool for rethinking the category of the human uh, and moving away from the category of the human as we begin to reckon with the ruination that the human has imposed upon the world. My book takes its title, obviously, from Maurice Sendak's uh, beautiful book, if people don't know this, uh, outside of a, an English-speaking context. It's a, a book of very few words, but many um, ways of visualizing uh, the wild things that occupy a place, a space, and a time, and a set of practices that are opposed to the human. And so we want to think with wild things um, about life otherwise. So let me just say something about the disorder of things, uh, which is an important part of the argument that I tried to make in uh, Wild Things. And, you know, we're so used to thinking about modernity through the work of someone like Michel Foucault, who has explained to us the way in which expertise managed, governed, and made ideological uh, the world as we know, know it through the distribution of new forms of classification in the 18th century. And those forms of classification, many of which were botanical and many of which focused on animal worlds on the one hand and racialized, uh, newly racialized uh, people on the other, uh, the, that, that activity of classification in the 18th century um, has been seen as a kind of realm of knowledge separate from colonialism and capitalism when in fact it adheres to those structures and is part and parcel of the new organization of governance that we call modernity. But here's my point. As long as there is an order of things, there must also always be a disorder of things. And it is to that disorder that Wild Things uh, wants to look. In fact, Foucault in, um, uh, the Order of Things talks about an untamed ontology that is almost implied by the idea that there's a world out there, people, and we as travelers and explorers and uh, scientists can go out and know it and discover it and name it. Uh, and Foucault is also holding on to the idea that there is always something outside of the classifiable, the recognizable, the legible. And that, those kinds of things occupy a space that he calls an untamed ontology. And it's that untamed ontology that I believe holds a kind of promise, a bewildering promise for thinking about life, being, uh, futurity and so on outside of the ideological frame that we have inherited. Probably the best place disciplinarily to look for the critique of the human that I'm sort of glancingly referring to is Black Studies. And I just want to reference here Zakia Jackson's new book called Becoming Human, in which Zakia Jackson says, you know, the most damning uh, uh, way in which we might think about the problem of the human is through slavery. And she offers in Becoming Human a really deeply critical uh, view on the human that in the end leaves us with no choice but to abandon the human. You know, we're all living in the ruins of these other worlds and not only other worlds, but we're other worlds with other visions for the future, visions that we have not realized. So when we go to the ruin, we don't just mourn a world gone by, we're also mourning the dreams that those people had of a different future than the one into which we have arrived. And on behalf of those earlier dreams, 
we have to unmake, unbuild, and unimagine the current condition. On behalf of that, uh, you know, the anonymous group from France, the Invisible Committee, offered a couple of years ago in their manifesto called Now that we should destitute the world. And chapter four of that book is called Let's Destitute the World. And I know destitution has a really very particular, uh, you know, implication. It, it seems to imply that some people should be dispossessed and others not. But in fact, in a world that is so rapacious and greedy, we actually do have to use some of these words like destitution and dispossession and dismantling to think about how to undo um, the logic of domination. So just to give you a few examples of this that will guide us through the next three sections on um, dismantling. Um, if you think about it, uh, you know, we should be destituting places of uh, thinking like the university. And this is in fact the argument of Moten and Harney's book, The Undercommons, if people are familiar with that text, um, where the idea is that the university, rather than being the place where people imagine alternatives, has in fact become the prop to maintain the status quo. So we need other spaces like the one that you're in, in Riga, uh, other spaces where thinking happens separate from the disciplinary, separate from the administrative and separate from the monetary. Those are the important sites of public intellectual labor today. Second, we see this in the protests that particularly have taken place in the US. The judicial system and all that it implies, including the police, including uh, corrupt government, that system is a, a kind of barrier to justice. Rather than being the site that can deliver justice, these calls in the US today to defund the police, for example, have finally recognized that the police, the courts, the judges, the governors, the politicians are in no way available to us as people who will deliver justice, equality, liberty, opportunity, but in fact are in the way. And so we have to move forward without them. Um, similarly, and there's no better time to think about the fact that we have to shift and change the way that medicine works, right? We're in the US in particular, which has been the least, um, the place least oriented towards any kind of national healthcare system, we can see that this, this horrendous aggregate of insurance regimes uh, and risk calculations and algorithms that are being used to administer medical response, we see in COVID that in fact, uh, medicine simply hands us over to a series of tests and treatments that are extremely expensive and have absolutely nothing to do with health. So if COVID is nothing, it has to be an opportunity to rethink what we mean by health, okay? And health clearly means setting up the right relationship to not just other humans, which we see now the symbol of the mask is the symbol of how to care for others rather than just yourself, but also how we relate to vegetation and animal life. And when we get those calculations wrong, the virus is here to show us what uh, the consequences will be. So finally then, and this absolutely speaks to Sophia's quotation at the beginning from Ursula Le Guin, um, the Invisible Committee says, to destitute the government is to make ourselves ungovernable. Ungovernable, we must become ungovernable in this moment because governance is not you know the setting of a, a fair order of things governance is simply rule regulation and exploitation so what if we went back to the 1970s and looked for different models for how to be in relation okay that's what i want to do next and uh on behalf of that with a little nod again to sendak and one of the things that I say in the book is that Sendak's um, storybook for children is trying to understand what the relationship is on the one hand between animals and children, and on the other hand, between the child and the sovereign power that is represented by his or her parents um, and other forms of power that can be imagined only outside of the nuclear family, right? The nuclear family with its psychoanalytic triangles sort of says, 
You can be a real person in the world only if you accept sovereign power and rule as the, uh, you know, the channel uh, for being and becoming. And Where the Wild Things Are by Morris Sendak, Sendak asks us to question whether there are other forms of adulthood that do not um, depend so thoroughly on sovereignty. Okay, I'll do this piece. I want to do it a bit um, more quickly just because I have published on it already. Um, but for me, I feel endlessly inspired by the art movement from the 1970s, spearheaded by Gordon Matta Clark, a, a Chilean, a part of a Chilean immigrant uh, family in New York City, um, and called you know, with this, this punning turn of phrase, an architecture, which holds within it obviously anarchy and architecture. But when put together, you have a kind of anti-architecture on the one hand, uh, but also an architecture that doesn't seek to contain, it seeks to unleash and unleash a kind of spatial chaos that has and holds within it seeds of possibility. So I just wanna lay out for people who don't know what this movement looks like and encourage us, in fact, again, thinking back to Ursula Le Guin, to look to the 1970s, in fact, for some indications about how to move forward. Why the 1970s? Because in the 1970s, this, these world cities or global cities that we lived in were still ruined. They were ruined by World War II. They were ruined by economic um, uh, downturns around the world. They were uh, ruined and awaiting the kind of reconstruction uh, that took place through urban planning uh, and imaginative projects of the uh, 1980s. Also in the 1970s, there's no internet, okay? There's no internet. There are very, very unruly art movements uh, all around the world, the 1968 movements, the punk movements, and so on. And people were engaged in squatting, in mutual aid projects, in DIY projects that we should go back and learn from. We do not have to reinvent the wheel. So as a guide to an architecture, um, one last quote from the Invisible Committee, it's only the, from the destituent standpoint that one can grasp all that is incredibly constructive in the breakage. And the person who really puts that to work then is Gordon Matta Clark, who said in one of his notes, nothing works. And that nothing, by the way, is the same nothing that you just heard Sophia refer to, the you have nothing, you need nothing, you own nothing. And only by having nothing, owning nothing, expecting nothing, only then can you think about the concept of freedom. Okay, our problem is we are too engaged in the something, in the having, in the being, in the owning. So here's a sort of orientation to dispossession, the dispossessed of Le Guin's title, in which we are offered a completely different understanding of freedom, a freedom that comes through an ideology, not of nihilism per se, but of nothing, no thing. Okay, this is just a, a quick, uh, Example of what uh, Gordon Matt Clark does. This is one of his, I believe this is in fact the um, spiral that he built into a uh, building that was being demolished in Paris in the 1970s to make way for the Centre Pompidou, which was being built. And he intended this very gorgeous spiral that he built into this 17th century building that the city was busy tearing down. He wanted to draw attention to the way in which modernity constantly demands the deconstruction, or in fact, just the destruction of certain you know, landmarks in order to build and create. And that is in fact, the very dynamic of gentrification that most cities are uh, now um, characterized by. And particularly in COVID, with evictions everywhere, with luxury apartments falling into disrepair and ruination. It is a really interesting moment to turn back to the beginning of gentrification that we saw in the 1970s. The other reason that it's cool and interesting to think with an architecture though is it gives us a different orientation to the body. Architecture is a really cool, 
discourse for thinking outside of the logic of the body that's just sort of hydraulically operated by drives and desires and uh, form scripts and orientations to the family. Psychoanalysis, as Foucault said, holds everything in place. It, uh, it cannot be the language of undoing. So instead, we might want to think about how bodies are shaped, how they are framed, how they are built, and therefore how they are unbuilt. And you can find many examples of this exact kind of intellectual orientation um, to the body and so on um, through the work of uh, Karen Barad, Ava Hayward and others. So um, just to, you know, I just wanna offer that like trans studies, for example, uh, has been um, really, really influenced by architectural conceptions of uh, self. Um, and of course, all the debates about bathrooms uh, that have heralded the public awareness about trans and transgender uh, bodies has been routed through this quintessential binary architecture of the bathroom. And I've been to events, for example, where people are asked to choose between two bathrooms. One says philosopher and one says revolutionary. I mean, you know, why not, right? Why, why it, does the morphology of the body determine the way in which we uh, publicly use space? But it does, it does. And, you know, if you just think about the way uh, homes are built nowadays, they're so cookie cutter, right? There's a formula. You have a dining room, a living room, a kitchen. You have a master bedroom and two satellite bedrooms. And that tells you everything about the family that has provided the script for architecture in the first place. And a realtor friend told me recently that realtors are no longer allowed to use the phrase master bedroom. Um, and master bedroom is seen as being like unnecessarily patriarchal. Um, and so people are instead talking about the main bedroom. Um, so this is super interesting, the, the fact that architecture holds within it an entire history, not only of the body, also of gender, and also of gendered arrangements of collectivity like the family. In more obvious ways, the architect has always been male, and this is a scene from The Fountainhead, uh, the film associated with Anne Rand's book, in which you know the, the master figure for modernity is the architect. And the architect becomes a sort of special male patriarchal figure who will build the world godlike in his image. And of course, if you have such a, a gender division, Louise Bourgeois many years earlier reminded us that the woman is always associated with the home, the house, the domestic interior, which is always a kind of carceral system that holds her in her place, even as she houses new life, okay? So these things are all obvious, but within queer studies, um, people have turned back to architecture for all kinds of reasons. This is a nice image from the 1970s of the An Architecture Group, which was a loose confederate of um, collaborators on the Lower East Side, New York City, included people like Richard Landry, and Laurie Anderson and set itself up against people like Le Corbusier who imagined fascist style that if you build the right kind of city, then people would be manageable. They would be contained. Their protests would be stopped before they even had a chance to grow. And people would not be able to imagine disruption precisely because order would be imposed from the outside in and from the inside out. So to protest that, in a way, the Anne Architecture Group, which held meetings in a New York City in the 1970s that was literally falling down, they carried out all kinds of projects that were not only architectural, but often involved sharing food, distributing food, and calling attention to the way in which the city was not set up for disabled people or was polluted in ways, especially in places like the Bronx, that was deeply detrimental to communities of color. So this was a very, very important uh, collective. The vocabulary that Matta Clark used was rather than you know, building and angles and efficiency and ergonomics, the vocabulary that Matta Clark uh, offered under the heading of an architecture was cutting, slashing, carving, splitting. And that I believe is a much better vocabulary 
for gender studies and particularly for transgender bodies, which after all bear the marks of cutting, slashing, uh, carving, carving a new body out of a morphology of the old. So there are so many things that an architecture can uh, offer us. It was Paul Preciado who many, many years before the architectural turn in trans studies, wrote a book called Pornotopia based on his PhD at Princeton, which tried to explain 1970s patriarchy through the uh, case study of the Playboy Mansion. And it's quite a brilliant book for just thinking about patriarchy, not as a new embodiment of masculinity, but as an entire architectural imposition of life that we've thought about anyway, in terms of this split between the urban and the suburban, right? If you think about the, the TV series, Mad Men or something, uh, the urban becomes a site of masculine bachelorhood and the suburban becomes a site of what Betty Friedan called the domestic gulags of feminine uh, housewife uh, duties. So anyway, Preciado gave us this language for thinking about a patriarchal form that was architectural. And if patriarchy is architectural, then the answer to patriarchy has to be architectural too, or in this case, an architectural. So we have to unbuild it. The, however, somebody who got there before Paul Preciado in terms of unbuilding world's patriarchy, white supremacy, and that was, of course, Audre Lorde, who in her most famous statement said the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And I just like to go back to this quote now through an architecture to think about Audre Lorde as one of the original and architectural theories. Uh, she was offering us with this phrase, not simply a way of thinking outside of the logics of the master, but also a project, a praxis oriented towards dismantling. And that, by the way, is the key term in an architecture with one of Matt Clark's most famous projects, which was called splitting. So he bought a house from his dealers in 1974 that was sitting on a piece of land that the dealers had bought for very little money because of course in 1974, there was already a downturn in the real estate market it was the beginning of this boom bust economy that has basically made the real estate market into a kind of roller coaster. And after the post-war boom, the 1970s were a moment of economic collapse. And so when his friends bought this land, there was a house on it that they didn't want. So they gave it to Gordon Matt Clark and he set about creating an artwork out of it. And the artwork was literally splitting the house down the middle. Now, the important piece of this is that this splitting of the house calls attention to the logic of the house, the way that the house is set up for a certain kind of domestic order. But notice the way in which this artwork functions. It's not just the, the splitting from the outside, it's the fact that then from the inside, what you become aware of is this V-like space, you know, the void, if you like, that the house is trying to cover up. And so what an architecture does is it reminds us uh, about the way in which bodies are implotted in space, but also the way in which space defines orientation as much as walls, right? Going back to Le Guin again, one of her main characters says, you know, people who build wall walls are the real problem. What we have to do as anarchists is figure out how to unbuild. Um, and this is exactly what the an architecture uh, shows us. Now, Interestingly, when you want to split a house, just to tell you technically what this actually means, when you want to split a house, you can't just sawzall it down the middle. What Matt Clark had to do was tip the house back on its foundation and then make the cut that allowed the house to sort of fall open. And indeed, at least one feminist critic said that it was a violation of the house and accused Matt Clark of uh, symbolic rape. So think about how powerful this is that he took a chainsaw, he sawed through the frame of the house and he set the house up to collapse backwards on itself. It's that gesture that I'm calling an architectural where you don't bring the whole thing down, you allow it to fall open. And in regards to that, that nothing, that little space that you see when the house opens up, 
That's the nothing of Gordon Matter Clark's phrase, nothing works. The thing that's doing the work in the artwork splitting is the piece of nothing, okay? So let's move forward with nothing then. Um, just a few examples of queer artists who I think are the kind of heirs to the Gordon Matter Clark project. Castles here in one of their very early works becoming an image where they are literally destroying a piece of clay in the dark and in the process destroying their body as they hurl their body against the clay. And the piece is finished when the piece of clay is sort of destroyed and the artist has collapsed. It's a kind of, you know, fighting the clay to the point of collapse. That's another one of these an architectural projects. And the last uh, person is Boy Child, who's worked with the uh, uh, queer trans artist Wu Sang um, on a number of different projects where they call up a kind of apocalyptic future in which Boy Child performs uh, an unbecoming and unbeing and crawls out of the wreckage of apocalyptic uh, spaces. All right. So second uh, case study for undoing, unmaking, dismantling um, is one that I'm going to give the term bewilderment. So now we can kind of get into the uh, keyword of uh, bewilderment. So bewilderment is different from wildness, different from denaturalization, different from rewilding. It, it really holds within it a kind of anti-epistemology. So think of it like an architecture is a kind of anti-architecture. Bewilderment is an anti-epistemology. So if an epistemology is a system of knowing how we come to know, bewilderment is the system of unknowing how we come not to know the things that have in other moments seem kind of inevitable. Bewilderment has a long history. It's part of a set of words that, you know, we use as synonyms now but that in the past have delineated very different realms of emotion and that you can trace histories through these words. So if you, the, and this is obviously very much about the, the English uh, history of these words. So amazement, it, to be amazed is to be lost in a maze. I mean, I guess back in the 16th century, people wandered around in mazes a lot, right? I mean, it's not something we do on a regular basis. And in fact, getting lost is an unlikely scenario in an area of, GPS and smartphones. But if you think about it, prior to maps, prior to GPS technologies, people were lost a lot. I even remember in the 60s and 70s when I was young, getting lost in cities all the time. Go back to Freud's essay, The Uncanny. He says the uncanny can be captured in the experience of getting lost in an unfamiliar city. That experience is almost gone for us almost completely disappeared, that we, unless we leave the phone at home and just wander around, all of that work from the 70s and 80s by people like Michel de Soto, these pedestrian acts, all the work by Walter Benjamin, One Way Street and so on, about the possibility of moving through a city in an unpredictable, uh, unplanned, unscripted way, is contained in these words like amazement, astonishment, bewilderment. And those words are almost, almost archaic at this point. But notice what they all share, amazement, astonishment, bewilderment, is a kind of stunned curiosity. Like what is happening, a baffling, uh, but an, a bafflement that's close to being enchanted, astonishment, a stoned, knocked out by a stone, right? Amazing how astonishment has lost completely the connotation of knocked out by a stone and just become, um, in fact, again, a very rarely experienced um, emotion. So these emotional states that are no longer available to us represent at this point an affective archive to which we should return in order to decolonize place. All right. On behalf of that project, I turn to the work of Kent Monkman, who is a Cree Irish artist, First Nations artist, lives in Canada in Toronto, and paints stunning, massive, beautiful canvases in which he retells the story of colonization from the perspective of the indigenous, uh, which is an incredible project 
And if you look up his work, you'll see that he has hundreds, hundreds of these canvases. They're painstaking, they're beautiful, they are massive. And they're massive because they are intended to convey world. They're, they're, they're not miniatures, they are not details, they are not fragments, they are everything. And they are oriented towards a paradigm that he calls seeing red right, where red obviously refers to an indigenous perspective on the one hand, um, but also to rage, anger, a reconfigured uh, perspective that comes about through the decolonial. So if we just look at this painting from 2014 that was taken from a show that he did in Toronto called Shame and Prejudice, a story of resiliency. And it, it took place uh, the same year as Canada was celebrating its 150th birthday, whatever that means, and his paintings were there to try, try to disrupt the settler discourse of a birthday with the um, indigenous sense of uh, ruination, the anniversary of destitution, genocide, and so on. And the painting, this really um, uh, captures the methods that Monkman use, uses. The organizing figure is the matador in the center holding what is recognizable as a colonial blanket, a Hudson uh, uh, Company blanket used by the settlers. The bull, there are buffaloes that represent a kind of uh, indigenous relationship to land and animals, but there's also a Picasso bull, uh, you know, painted from this kind of fractured perspective. Um, and then up above you have clashing systems of theology, spirituality, and communication. You have a totem pole, but you also have uh, uh, electrical wires and feeds. You have on the ground to the right, uh, an injured toreador, and we'll get to him in a moment, but you also have an indigenous healer tending to him and another indigenous figure with a feather taking that crouch stand that is repeated in the um, figure on the other side of uh, the central matador. The matador is a self-portrait. This is a, an alter ego that Kent Monkman uses, and she calls herself Miss, uh, Miss Chief Testicle Eagle, um, and Monkman often does drag performances in this character. In every Monkman work, there are very clearly two-spirit characters, trans characters, who are part and parcel of the reimagination of everything. This is clearly a scene of a riot. It is a scene of a certain kind of carnage and it is all at once the scene of healing. The Toreador in what I'm looking at as the right hand corner is taken from a painting by Manet from 1864. And again, this is very typical of Kent Monkman. He isn't just repainting Canadian uh, modernity. He's also repainting modern art. And there are multiple paintings by Monkman in which modern artists are figured as a subset to an indigenous orientation to the aesthetic that modernists have simply appropriated and copied. So he takes this little um, detail from a Manet painting and then puts the figure into the corner of his canvas, not as the place where vengeance has been wreaked on a white male body, but notice that while the body is dead, the indigenous healer tends to him. So it's a completely different orientation to death, to healing um, and to kind of political struggle. Uh, a few more of these, this is um, uh, another one of these self portraits, but it's also called um, artist and uh, uh, model. And you can see that um, in the bottom right hand corner, notice how Monkman keeps putting things in that corner, that seemingly discarded corner is a place where the stuff of modernity is located. In the last one, it was Manet's Toreador. Here, it's the camera. The camera, which would be the, you know, progressive uh, new technology for capturing an image has been pushed to the ground and in fact has a tomahawk in it. It hasn't just been pushed over, it's literally been destroyed, unbuilt, unmade, dismantled by the technology of the tomahawk. Instead, Mischief uh, Eagle Testicle is drawing the image of a cowboy who has been tied to a tree 
in a sort of uh, Saint Sebastian way. He has he has the arrows coming out of him. He's he's both a martyr, and even as he's being tortured, he's also aroused. I mean, it's a very clear uh, erection, um, and he's being he's in a sort of S and M dance with the artist. But then there's that sort of mise on a beam, where the artist is doing a pictograph. Uh, of the, the cowboy, even as the painting as a whole has been made by an indigenous hand. So there's a commentary here on how indigenous art is represented as primitive, how modern art is represented as complex, and how the indigenous restages the entire encounter in order to allow indigenous imagination to unmake modern art altogether. So that's the project here of bewilderment to send you into a spiraling set of references that confuse us as to where we are in time, space, and power. And so let's just stop there on Kent Monkman. And um, we could say that he's both mastering Western art, remaking it, uh, and destroying its power to imagine the world in its own image. So my last section then, I wanna make uh, the, I want to borrow from Monkman these scenes that he paints of notice horizontality. There's a kind of, the, every, all the action in a Monkman painting takes place across a horizontal axis that suggests that things occupy the same plane, that we are not always in this uh, Western vertical order uh, that might be anchored by God or by government, by a sovereign being or by a governor, a ruler but instead there's a kind of distributed space of uh, power, affect, embodiment, and rule. And it's that horizontality that I want to use now to bewilder our relationship to animals and conjure the possibility of an animal riot. We're sort of comfortable in a Euro-American tradition of thinking about the human as a caretaker for animals, not just as a caretaker, but as an intimate, as you know, the dog is the man's best friend, the cat is the Derrida's, you know, orientation to animal indifference that he nonetheless wants to master. The household pet is understood to, to provide a sign of human ambivalence, of, of sorry, human benevolence. But in fact, I'm gonna argue that the pet is a way more ambivalent signifier. And if we investigate that actual relationship between human and animal that pertains to the pet, what we find is a much uglier understanding of the human and one that must be undone. So John Berger in his you know, inimitable way captured this little history of when animals went from being creatures that we collaborated with outside to creatures that we loved inside. How did that happen? So he says, the practice of keeping animals regardless of their usefulness, the keeping exactly of pets in the 16th century, the word usually referred to a lamb raised by hand, is a modern innovation. And on the social scale on which it exists today is unique. It is part of that universal but personal withdrawal into the private small family unit, decorated or furnished with mementos from the outside world, which is such a distinguishing feature of consumer societies. And I love this. Uh, this quote does just so much work in terms of reminding us that we have thought about animals in terms of their usefulness to us. And then when we started having relations with animals that exceeded utility, we imagined it through the frame of love. But the question is, is this love or is in fact this domination and the extension of the reach of the nuclear family out into animal worlds that have nothing to do with nuclearity whatsoever? So I want to end by applying intense pressure to the shared household of human animal and even suggesting that it is at the very root of current environmental uh, crises. Berger also reminds us that uh, the zoo and the circus were the previous institutions through which we engaged animals. The zoo where uh, large animals were shipped around the world and then put on display for uh, adoring crowds. The circus as a place where animals, uh, the wild was trained to offer entertainment um, to human 
audiences, right? But in all of these institutions, the idea was that there was a wildness that was just being sort of held at bay. The wildness that was being held at bay in the circus and the zoo is completely and utterly domesticated and tamed when the animal comes into the family home. And people like uh, Jason Herbal, who wrote a book called Fear of an Animal Planet, The Hidden History of Animal Resistance, suggests that what we have seen as animals going wild is not just like a rogue elephant that's gone mad and has gone into a kind of frenzy of destruction, but needs to be understood as animal riot or resistance. And he gives examples. Um, he actually compares um, rogue animals to what James C. Scott calls weapons of the weak, um, the, the ways in which subjugated groups uh, fight back against complete and utter rule. So the rogue elephant, for example, very often rages through a whole crowd of people and will pick out its hated trainer from scores of people around it and will pick its way through a crowd of, say, children, find the trainer and throw the trainer to the ground. And so Herbal's point is, in fact, that animals are extremely angry. They're engaged in something that we would call via Spivak, subaltern resistance, but that because we cannot imagine that animals might refuse us, might resist us, might rebel against us, we classify it as pathological behavior on the part of the actual animal. Now, there've been lots of great films that I myself have written about, like Chicken Run, in which we've used animation to at least engage and entertain fantasies of animal revolt. And Chicken Run is perhaps the most successful. It's the one I particularly love. Why? Because chickens are all female. So this is also a feminist collective uh, in which the male figures, the roosters are rendered almost completely useless to the revolution. Um, and it's a revolution that has, it has gender, it has sexuality, and it has an economic critique because in Chicken Run, the chickens realize that they're being exploited for their eggs on the one hand, but that the farmers are entering a new phase of production and they're about to produce chicken pot pie. And so the chicken pot pie necessitates their total sacrifice. So what they do is they build uh, an airplane to fly out of the gulag in which they find themselves. And this is a fantastic uh, film that people want to just see as a sort of charming claymation when in fact, it's a very skillful depiction of uh, Gramscian um, uh, revolutionary principles. One that's a little bit less successful, but that I wanna share with you because of its focus on pets is The Secret Life of Pets. And there are one or two of these, this franchise film uh, out at the moment. Um, so just to give you the plot summary for those uh, few of you who have not seen The Secret Life of Pets, the concept is that by day, uh, the pets are sort of just shut in their apartments waiting their owner's uh, return. And by night, they are beloved creatures attached to their uh, owners. Um, however, when the pets sort of get together uh, and go off into the city one day, they discover an underground group of discontented uh, creatures who have been abandoned by their owners and have formed, if you can believe it, an underground resistance movement that is dedicated to rising up taking to the streets and not just like, you know, nipping or biting their owners, but killing them, like destroying human worlds. So when I, you know, saw the preview for this, I'm like, yes, this is exactly what I'm after. Of course, it doesn't really measure up uh, because the animals are just pissed off that their owners abandoned them. And once the good owners come to their senses and come back around and say, sorry, little kitty cat, sorry little pooch, I really do love you. All notions of rebellion are, uh, uh, you know, quelled. But what I do like in the film is the idea of a kind of reversible domestication. The idea that the animal could be domesticated, but could under certain conditions make fugitive dashes to freedom and become feral once more. And to me, that's another way of thinking about be, will, de, Month, becoming wild once more, be wilding, uh, being becoming less enclosed in the uh, apartment, uh, 
less connected to the pet food that is used to cajole the animal and to control it. Um, so bewilderment here as a route to animal revolution. So it, many of the this film and then the herbal text that I um, referenced refer to the fact that while we imagine that we have access to the pets and conscious world and that we know what the pet wants and we know it wants food and we know it wants cuddling and we know it wants stroking, we know it wants grooming. These, these ideas, these texts and films suggest that there might be another world of animals and pets in which they're actually plotting freedom and escape. Um, and that what we understand as love could be a kind of subterfuge uh, in which the pet awaits a moment when it can make a dash uh, to freedom. And I think the reason we can't entertain this possibility and instead we tell ourselves stories of pet human love is precisely because of the critique of the human that is embedded in precisely uh, those fantasies. The other thing, by the way, that we do, and this is absolutely present in, for example, Donna Haraway's work on her companion species and when species meet and her all of her references to dog owning and dog training. There's a fantasy of what she calls co-evolution that to me is just, just that. It's a fantasy. You know, animals and dogs don't co-evolve. Dogs are being trained, domesticated, um, and completely and utterly owned by humans. And the line that we draw, by the way, remember when it comes to pet owning is that we can love on them, we can kiss them. This happens in, in Haraway's description of her relation to her dog where she's exchanging spit with the dog and kissing the dog. We can do all of those things, but we cannot have sex with the dog, right? So we imagine that the big dividing line is sex when in fact the big dividing line may in fact be about the fact that we have domesticated these creatures and demanded that they serve our purposes. So I'm not gonna show you that clip, but I just wanna end then with this film. Um, some people may have seen it was a Hungarian film called White God, which is a, a quotation of a Samuel Fel Fuller film from the 70s called White Dog, in which racists were training their white dogs to attack black people. So there's a long history of kind of racial animus between particularly dogs and particularly black people that we should consider here before we just invest in the dog. But this film imagined a world in which dogs organized dogs scripted a rebellion and dogs rose up against their owners. And the film's basic principle is that a young girl um, is uh, in a family where the parents get divorced and her mother abandons her to her father's care. And she has a dog, but the father's apartment building doesn't allow dogs. So they have to let the dog go. The dog is put in a shelter, it's abused, it's trained to engage in dog fighting, it escapes, it finds other dogs and it leads a dog rebellion. And I do want to play a clip from this film because what's beautiful about the film is that the, the human story is barely even important in the film. The film is trying cinematically to inhabit the dog's position. So let me just see if I can play the clip.
And this is a scene from the end of the uh, film. So the riot that we were promised in The Secret Life of Pets is actually delivered uh, in uh, White God. Um, so I just want to call attention to the complete indifference that the animal has, in fact, for the human, despite our fantasies that we project onto uh, pets, um, but also the way in which many of these films end with a kind of clear question that is at the very heart, and this is what I want to end with, the very heart of what I'm trying to call bewilderment. What if we were able to reimagine uh, the world to understand that we are not masters uh, you know, we, we are not people who can just manage the entire um, uh, series of existences that surround us. We are not often the authors of revolution, but in relationship particularly to animal worlds, what if we are the masters who must be overthrown? And from that perspective, perhaps we can begin to think about life otherwise. Thank you so much, Jack. I hope you got a sense of, of Jack's mind throughout this talk. We began with uh, Gordon Matt Clark. We went to an indigenous critique of modern art, from there to Chicken Run and Animal Revolt. And we end with what Franz Fanon would call a program of complete disorder to rethink the world otherwise. So thank you so much, Jack, for this um, yeah. journey. Uh, taking us where the wild things are. And whilst we uh, give some time for people to kind of gather their thoughts, collect some questions, I'd like to sort of jump in with one, um, one first question that perhaps has to do with the temporality of, um, of, of the program of bewilderment. And Specifically, you, you've, you've mentioned the invisible communities now, and now is certainly a moment where um, abolition has taken a center stage in world politics, uh, where destitution is taken seriously, where the, the falters of constituent politics are um, up for grabs and visible to all. And I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about what, um, what is at stake in destituting and abolishing the institution and what that might mean for, for another consideration of time. I wasn't thinking about time so much as many of these institutions through which we make connections and by which we are governed are really, you know, they're quite old in relationship to the way in which the world has changed. I mean, they're, they're part and parcel of shifts and changes from the 18th and 19th century from uh, monarchy to state governance. Um, and then, of course, through the 20th century, the, the, the sort of consolidation of certain forms of state power has been so ruinous and yet so unchallenged. And I think destitution um, is a way of trying to um, insist, if you like, on a rethinking of the political altogether and reimagining of how we might govern ourselves, you know, separate from these kinds of uh, state apparatuses uh, and institutional forms of power. And of course the institutional forms of power are all oriented towards status quo, holding things in place and holding down an order of things rather than shifting it. Because of that, that's why in the most recent protests in the US, you saw a shift, a really, really clear shift from, you know, we want justice and we want it now to defund the police, tear down the police station, um, offer alternatives to the court system, given that these systems are put in place to anchor and maintain a racial order. And that became so clear to people through the various, you know, police brutalities that we've had, we've witnessed in very public ways because of social media in the last 10 years, there's nothing new about them. It's just the newness is the platform through which they're shared that I think people are really insisting on change, not as being heard or being recognized, but as engaging in creative destruction. Um, and I think this, um sentence that you've, this quotation that you've mentioned before of um, don't, bring, um, don't bring the space down, let spaces fall open. 
um, speaks perfectly well to it and this sort of po program of political exposure of, what, of what's crumbling, of, uh, of the ruination that we've left behind is quite visible. I'm not sure if there's a question already, um, any question, oh, there's a few of them. So let's start by this wonderful artist sitting uh, here with us today. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Tomas and I was wondering, I remember once a talk by um, Boventura Dos Santo and then it was more about how to put in practice than in your own life. Uh, and he said, well, you know, because of, of the critique also and you being an, an academic and, and how we deal with the, the reality of the world and how we can maybe destitute that. And I remember he always said, you know, 50% of my time I, you know, I teach in the university, I do the academic world, and 50% I go to the field, and I meet the indigenous community, and I, you know what I mean, a little bit like, a, a, I would like to hear from you, you know, you know, Gordon Mata Clark will go and, and, and cook for, for the people at the Bronx, right? And it's a, a little bit, I want to hear from you, you know, what are the practical things, you know, what, what, what we can maybe bring down to earth on, on, on how your, your time is shared with that thoughts and, 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 and theory and practice and, and activities. Thank you. That's a great, great comment and question. And of course, none of us are only, you know, the institution that we're a part of any more than an artist is just wedded to the art market. We're all of us trying to figure out ways to do different kinds of work that the job that we have affords. Um, and I, I'm involved in a number of institutes that are offering classes, either free or at an incredibly reduced rate, where you understand that, and not just that you're teaching people things, but that you want to engage in intellectual uh, uh, exchange that doesn't get monetized through the university, that, that it's not about a client uh, host relationship, but that it's part of what M Moten and Hani call um, um, you know, thinking that, that study, they call it study, you know, where you, you get together with people and you study and you don't need to be paid for it and they don't need to pay for it. And honestly, you know, I don't think we're quite realizing that yet. Zoom, if we can figure it out, might give us the opportunity to open up classes so that there are the people in the classroom who have had to pay for it through Columbia or whatever institution, but maybe there's a way to share those feeds so that there are other people who could never afford college who are also able to take classes uh, as they like. That of course is the promise of some of this uh, online content. But as quickly as we say that, you know, firewalls are being set up and blocks are being established so that the, only the people who have paid the money are gonna get it. The other thing in New York City is I think we're all trying to figure out space in New York City right now. I mean, the city has been so dominated by these in real estate investments in a way that seemed to be completely eliminating all the kinds of spaces that Gordon Matter Clark would have had to work in, abandoned the spaces, spaces of disrepair that nobody wanted that then you could go into and build something. The spaces in which David Wanarovich worked and Keith Haring worked and Samuel Delaney has written about, those spaces have not been available in New York. But I think people, I think we're all asking whether they might be available again. You know, so I've, I've gone to a few of the protests and the, the events that are about sharing books, creating libraries, giving, uh, mutual aid, it's those mutual, you know, community fridges, all of those things that COVID demands, I think we're, people are trying to figure out how to script permanently into this new configured landscape of New York City. And, and may I add that there's also a sense of your work within feminist politics that is very much based on this idea of mutual learning. And, um, and over the years, uh, I have to confess, Jack is one of the most generous speakers I have worked with. I have seen so many talks of Jack over the years. And, and I think this idea of a public intellectual being able to shift between registers of sharing once and, and again is, is really, for me, fascinating as a way of making accessible, of, uh, of being able to learn with each other openly. Um, what we're seeing now, I think, and, and just to add to Jack, the promise of Zoom uh, being something like ARC, 
an Argus this pirate platform that was set up, um, I believe, in the 1990s, where people uh, scan their own books and upload them online, so books uh, on philosophy and critical theory. And this has made a whole library of knowledge available to so many people who could not otherwise afford or are not connected to an institution. So this might be what happens with Zoom, with people recording their own classes and just sharing them online. Um, so we're at the cusp of something really beautiful and important. And with that, I would like to give the word to um, the person with the, sh the pink shirt. Yes, please. Thank you. It's not really pink. <clears throat> So uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was uh, amazing. And the, the most amazing thing was to see Kent Monkman interpreted as something because I stumbled on this Instagram account just this year and I was just fascinated by what, by what I saw there. So it was really lovely. But the question or a comment which I wanted to ask was connected to a discussion I had with my friend just these days um, before this, this lecture. And uh, it seems to be interestingly connected to what you were speaking about. Because, you know, this, for me, just personally, this whole thing about bewilderment and being wild is about being in, op in opposition to the society in general. And you can see, in you know, in history, there were a lot of movements, religious, political, any philosophical, spiritual movements that would um, present themselves as a, again, in opposition to society, as liberating and making new ways and discarding old codes and bringing, but yeah, but the thing is bringing new ones. So you don't get into this totally wild thing of not having any reference point. You always go into creating new societies, new structures, new references, new uh, proper things to say, new improper things to say, new codes of conduct and so on. And so, where is <laughs> that actual bewilderment when we all become like animals and just stop being humans that oppress each other in you know any chosen way? Because it's really hard to be free and wild, <laughs> it seems, in this society, because you always step into uh, different reference points and try to, you know, if when you try to be yourself, you really often begin <laughs> to be in opposition to anyone else. So. Is there really this bewilderment or we just create new um, societies? Like when we were speaking about these animals and this animal riot in this movie, White God, uh, this is also our interpretation of what animals would be. Because in one way we interpret that they would be our lovely friends, in the other they are, they are the ones who would destroy us. And this is again our, our perception. And we made it upon our, you know, it's just... And is there a third way, really, <laughs> instead of commodifying mm -hmm. or uh, asking for a revolution that would, um, you know, swipe everything aside? Is there really another way to keep yourself, you know, both wild and and human at the same time? And is it, is it possible, yeah. <laughs> actually, this whole bewilderment thing? You know, it, it, that's great. Thank you so much. It, it, it's not simply a question of is it possible and if so how do we do it it's more a question of um changing the way we think about things that have become commonplace to us uh and particularly those commonplace things that confirm us in our so-called humanity if you know what i mean so the pet is a perfect example of that it's where the human feels themselves to be most good is that they have rescued an animal and loved the animal and given the animal a home, even as that very set of activities in relationship to the human is actually an extension of meat eating in the industrial production of food, the encroachment upon animal territories. And in fact, we can even sometimes say that we sometimes do say that pet owning is sort of the benevolent while these other things are the exploitative, but they're all a continuation of our relationship to animal life. So I'm not trying to say to you, you know, go wild. I'm trying to say that wildness, because it has been structured as the opposite of civilization, holds within it some of the tools that we may need to take down the world that we're in that is already in the midst of environmental crisis. This isn't a matter of fixing, repairing, redoing. It's a matter of unmaking, unbuilding, reimagining completely. And I think that environmental movements have been saying that for a long time. So if you go to someone like Kent Monkman, you realize that, you know, the, the very ways of being that we have tended to call indigenous hold within them all kinds of practices uh, in relationship to land, growing things, 
animal husbandry and so on that don't depend upon the ownership and exploitation that um, modern industrial societies have depended upon. So there's, there are lots of examples. This isn't about a third way. This is about a millionth way. The multiple ways that are already available to us through the history of art, through the history of indigenous practices, um, and through the history of consciousness. It's just that we're so stuck. We're so stuck in our everyday practices that are held in place by capitalism that we can't see the way out. Are there any other questions um, pending? Oh. Yeah, wow. Yeah. <laughs> There's the next question, that's the, at least. That's the revolution. <laughs> Here it is. Uh, yeah. you no, know, I'm thinking if we could... Um, yeah, maybe inspired with maybe other samples, just only to, to get notice binary relationship with animals. Uh, and since they are coming many times, uh, uh, the word indigenous, you know, there are so many other relationships that uh, indigenous community have with animals. Uh, I'm trying to have a different relationship with, with spiders, uh, which are these synanthropic animals which have go well, in that sense, uh, live inside our houses and, and how much you, you disrupt their, their form of living if you start to feed them. They know how to feed themselves. But, but there are a lot of uh, uh, other people living in, in this planet uh, uh, who have a very different relation with animals. Uh, and, and I think so we should really get inspired, right? Uh, uh, you know, but, but they have it really... Um, um, I don't know, I'm not, maybe, maybe, maybe Jack, you can, you can tell us samples of, of, of other ways also, how, how people have related with, with animals in, in different forms. Well, you know, just to say that we're, our relation to animal life is so routed through ownership, you know, that, that's part of the problem. It's like you have to, you have to change the, um, the conceptualization of the animal that it, uh, and also these, as you say, the sense that the animal should be inside or outside. This is something I want to see in my house. This is something I don't want to see in my house. Everything in relation to the human. There, there are, there are multiple ways that people have thought of relationships to animal lives on farms, in woods. Um, Eduardo Cohen's book, How Forests Think, gives many, many different examples. Uh, he focuses on indigenous communities in Ecuador, where the relationship to the animals they live among is not one of ownership or simply predation, but is one of, he talks about the way in which animals and humans share dreams in the forest, and that through sharing dreams, they're able to access another realm of being um, that it is not pragmatic and is not rational and is not instrumentalized. So those kinds of, to me, that kind of work, that kind of really, really imaginative uh, ethnography is super important to stepping outside of the ownership dynamics of, of the pet on the one hand, and then the exploitative dynamics of meat production on the other. Um, it, these do not have to be binary relations, but they, they have to be reimagined. Uh, almost completely. And they can't, they won't be reimagined on their own. They will be reimagined in relationship to this redoing and undoing of world that I'm referring to as a kind of conceptual process that is nonetheless being taken on in many places, little by little, through mutual aid, through uh, getting offline, uh, uh, through battling eviction, through withholding uh, payments on student debt or government loans or whatever. We have lots of economic forms of resistance, lots of forms of spatial resistance. And where those things sort of come together, I think we're in doing the work that I'm not calling for so much as calling attention to. Um, perhaps if we have about uh, 10 minutes before we finish our session today, um, so I'd like to ask what happens to nature when we go feral. Um, and the reason why I'm asking this is not only because in, in my last encounter with Jack, I asked, so what should we do? Should we re-enchant the human? Should we just let go of the human? So now I'm, I'm redirecting this to nature. But also because these two um, pivotal tip, tipping points, conceptual tipping points, have been quite important to the structuring of this program and have been uh, subject to very particular critical analysis by 
both Marisol de la Cadena, who uh, was with us uh, last week online, and also Tobias Rees, um, an anthropologist based in LA. Um, so both of these have been quite um, adamant in thinking the human after the human, nature after nature. So mm -hmm. I'd like to, to know what happens when we become, what happens to nature when we become feral. Well, we, we won't become feral, let's just be clear. You know, feral means actually um, a creature that cannot be trained or domesticated. So in my book, I talk about falconry and the way falconry works because you cannot train a falcon. You can only manage it for a short period of time. And one of the features of wild predatory birds is that while they will respond for short periods of time, uh, to the offer of food or meat or, uh, you know, they will learn how to fly a certain way to come back for the meat. They revert to being feral almost immediately, right? So humans are kind of the opposite of the feral in, in many ways. So it's not about going feral. It's more about folding the feral into one's conception of, of life rather than putting it as a limit to uh, human life. The category of the, nat of the natural I take up in the book a lot because the natural in interesting ways has been used to uh, pathologize queer people, obviously. And in fact, the terminology used early on uh, to make a distinction between normative sexual practices and non-normative ones before there was a concept of the normal were crimes against nature. So again, the queer gives us a vantage point to think about the way in which nature has far from just being a state in which people cohabit, nature has been one of these modern tools uh, that has, uh, you know, managed life, established norms, governed uh, activities and practices. And so it's through queer theory that we actually get a critique of the natural that I think can be uh, politically useful. And so one of the earliest texts on, in, on queer life from the 18. Uh, 60s, it was called Against Nature. And it was, you know, the story, Huisman's story of a dandy that became the model for Oscar Wilde's The Portrait of Dorian Gray, a dandy who was tired of the human completely and set himself up against nature um, in order to critique everything. Um, and that's one version of queer life is an anti-natural. I call it in the book post-natural, but I think you can go through the anti-natural as well. So we're not trying to look to return to nature, you know, we're trying to dismantle the category of the natural as well, because the category of the natural props up all kinds of systems that are, are part and parcel of ruination. And the same, I suppose, for uh, the categories of freedom, um, of um, all of these things that we have been uh, referring to as the as as pertaining to the individual self, um, yeah. and uh, I suppose just to echo uh, one of the references that well many of the references that you've made during the talk. So, uh, but also with um, Moton's call for um, not to consent to being a single being, um, and uh, I'd like to thank you very much, Jack, for. Um, um, for the patience of working again with me and also to join us today. Um, echo the thank you. thank you that is coming up online from Christopher Gallat. That was an utterly fascinating talk. Thank you, Jack. Um, and comes with a question. It says, I wonder if you have thoughts on the trajectory of humankind and bewilderment. Are we on the right track? What is the absolute ideal way forward? Oh, God asking the wrong person there. Uh, you know, I love these big questions. Thank you, Christopher. Um, I await your answer. You know, I mean, what is the right way forward? The right way forward is not to go forward, really. Um, and this refers back to Sophia's point about temporality. The temporar temporality of bewilderment is stasis in a way, not to say we're stuck, not to say uh, status quo, but to say pause, pause, stop. Uh, you know, we know from the various reports we get every day, wildfires in California, pieces of the Arctic shelf uh, falling in, into the water and expanding uh, the, the level of water around the world, the, the burning of the Amazon. I mean, we know 
we need to stop. And that's what's one of the things that's been interesting about COVID is the way in which it has brought travel to its knees. It's brought uh, uh, building uh, has stopped, you know, um, uh, the distribution of things and consumer goods has quieted. Um, pollution in some places has gone down. And I'm not saying, oh, good, you know, that's great. I'm just saying, why does it take a crisis for us to actually do the things that we should have already incorporated into daily life? So the way forward is to be a bit bewildered by the moment that we're in and be less sure about moving forward. Thank you, Jack. Um, join us next week for Avery Gordon's um, haunted talk uh, on ghosts, on what we left behind, on inhabiting or co-inhabiting the present uh, with the past and future. And um, so in, with, with this, I'd like to close our session and uh, ask you to join me in thanking Jack. Thank you. Thank you.